Yeah, I have the script is, I know OBS can start uh, recording from the command line, but the problem is I have to change the screen resolution first. So, you know, I can also probably just script that part. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'll just do that. Set up a little cron job, you know, so this all get done automatically. And it will start to replay the recording of about the same time from last semester, so I don't even have to be here. So YouTube, so I'll be recording my own YouTube replay in another recording that will then be re-uploaded to YouTube to have another duplicate session. <laughs> After 10 generations, I'm sure there will be some visible and audible de degradation because of all the you know, retranscoding of the uh, video and the audio. That would be kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Yep, I'll, I'll make more work for myself just to do less work. <clears throat> or I can just teach this class, you know, fully online asynchronously like everybody else. You guys didn't know that? Or you know that because, you know, you just could not get into one of the online sections. That's why you're here. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Uh, let, let me... Let me share this. Uh, let me see if I can find it. This is, it's rather amusing in a way. Okay, this is 440. This is the right screen. So I'm just going to stash it over here. All right, so this is the schedule for uh, spring uh, 2024, right? So I am teaching the same way, okay, different classroom, you know, 305, which is, I think that's just across, okay? <clears throat> And you can see how uh, Consumers is fully online. Bosom Lake has two sections, both fully online. And Sac City also has one section that is also fully online. I'm the only in-person person for CISP 440. And you can also see how the other ones are already on wait list. And I still have 24 open seats. <laughs> I think that's out of like 39, so I'm only like less than halfway through, uh, you know, filled up in this at this point. Whereas the other classes, you know, they're all on wait list already. This one only has two places left, you know. Yeah, two wait list uh, places available. So that means it's almost completely gone. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You mean for this semester? Uh huh. So I'm curious about you know whether it makes a difference or not. Whether it's you know whether it's an in-person class or whether it's an online class, does it make a difference? You know, I I'm pretty sure to some people it does, and to some other people it does not. Yeah. So would the introverts take the the one that is fully online? Or do you think those are just people who prefer to play League of Legends a little bit more? <laughs> There's a big difference. I mean, there are different types of uh, champions. <laughs> yeah, so I'm curious. I'm just you know, really curious. It's the, about the same situation in uh, CISP 310. Um, you know, except in CISP 310, Sac City does not even offer a single section. Um, so in that case, it's just the you know, Folsom Lake, CRC, and you know, ARC offering sections. Kind of strange. All right. So getting back to question uh, part three, <clears throat> generalize the constraint. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do is to generalize the constraints. So to do part three, you have to get part two done first, okay, which, is, which we did you know, the other day. So you can see that in part two, we already found a way so that we have, um, uh, vertex three V3 is reinserted into um, the set twice, once here and then the other time over here. So you have to kind of remember how we got it done, okay? You know, the trick is to make the actual shortest path look less desirable, you know, making the, the non-shortest path look more desirable. So if we get back <clears throat> to this note here, let me change the color to, let's say, green. Okay. 
So the path that is actually the shortest is going from two to zero and then to one. That is actually the shorter one. So we want that one to look not so desirable. And in order to make something look not so desirable, you want to make the heuristic value as high as possible. Um, and then the one that is not the shortest, which is from two to three and then to one, we want to make it look as, attract as attractive as possible. So that means the only va value, the, the only two values we can play with. Okay, so think about from the perspective of the algorithm. Um, we have no choice because the you know, vertex two is always the first one to take out of the set O, and then we look at the outgoing edges of vertex two because vertex two is the start vertex. It is you know, the point of origin. So that means you know, in the first iteration of the while loop, it is going to explore these two. So we basically are looking at vertex zero versus vertex three. We want to make we want to make vertex three look more attractive. Okay, so the bottom line is we want f of three to be less than f of zero, so that in the second iteration of the while loop, we would pick the wrong one, which is f of three. Does that make sense? Okay. So this part, okay, you know, how I came up with this, in, uh, this inequality has to do with what? It has to do with the algorithm itself. Because in the algorithm, how do we pick one vertex out of the set O when there are multiple ones is based on the F value. Is that okay? So that means, you know, understanding the algorithm or having it at least with you during the test is going to be important, okay? Unless you remember every single aspect of the algorithm. Otherwise, you're going to have to look it up. Yes, go ahead. Well, so let's find out, right? <clears throat> so we can, okay, so when I say three, it is V3, okay? It's just that I'm saving myself from you know, writing the V. <clears throat> so by definition, this is G of V3 plus f of v3 to the destination, oh, not f of, uh, yeah, plus h, you're correct. It is the heuristic value from v3 to the destination, and the destination in this case is v1, okay? And then the other one, which is f of uh, v0, it's kind of the same thing, it's g of v0, <clears throat> plus h of v0 v1. Is that okay? All right. The g value is easy in this case because <clears throat> by the time we get to v0 and by the time we get to v3, the g value is really just a sing the, the distance of a single uh, edge. Um, so one is going to be 24. So g of v3 is going to be 56. Okay, this is, we know that's going to be 56. The other one, we also know it, is, it has to be 24. Is that okay? So in other words, this is known to be 24, this is known to be 56, you know, after the first iteration through the while loop. Is that okay? Because this is, this is really important because now we have constants. So the inequality really is trying to say <clears throat> uh, 56 plus H of V3, V1, needs to be less than, um, what is it, 24 plus H of V0, V1. Is that okay? So this is one inequality. You can always kind of rework the inequality, put all the constants to one side, and then put the H value on the other side. It doesn't matter, okay, because I don't really care how you simplify or whether you simplify the uh, inequality or not. The other way to simplify the inequality is really just to do the calculation, uh, which is 56 minus 24 is 32, I think. So 32 plus H of V3, V1 has to be less than H of V0, V1. I just did a little algebra thing to simplify so that one side does not have a constant anymore. Is that okay? So this is a p one part of the inequality because there are other constraints. So if I were to write the answer, 
<clears throat> but this is the most important one. This is the one that made the algorithm to prefer the other path and then come back to explore this one. So we write down that equation. Okay, so we say 32 plus h of v3 v1 has to be less than h of v0 v1. All right, so are there any other constraints that we also have to write down? given that the distances are given to you already so you you have no control over the distances you can only you only have control over the heuristic values all right so the other thing is we need all the heuristic values to be greater than or equal to zero so you know but that's easy to do okay so we just say this has to be greater than or equal to zero this also has to be greater than or equal to zero what other constraints do we have to say, or do we have to include? Yes. Exactly. There's an upper limit to the uh, heuristic value. I'm just double checking, make sure that I'm still recording. Yep, we good. Okay. So, what is the upper limit of these of each one of these heuristic value? So, look at the graph here. <clears throat> In order for the for A star to work, the heuristic value cannot overestimate. It can underestimate by a lot, but it cannot overestimate. So that means you know, we have to cap what each heuristic uh, value can be. So what about, so we'll work with one at a time. Okay, we'll just say the H of V0, V, uh, V1, sorry, there we go. Okay, so this has to be less than or equal to what? It has to be less than or equal to the length of the shortest path from V0 to V1. And what would that be? I mean, that's a pretty easy one. Huh? It's a 22 plus 15, right? Because your V0 is, oops, wait, yeah, V0 is here, V3 is here, V1 is over here. So that's the only path from V0 to V1. And it has, you know, quote unquote, the shortest length of the shortest path which is the only path in this case, has a length of 22 plus 15, which is uh, 37. So we have a cap of, you know, V0, V1. Yep. Uh, in the introduction, it says each uh, quality or inequality is the only distance of the distance function or heuristic function of that piece that causes the general value. Does that include both? Oh, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. So that would be D of V0, V3 plus, thank you. And I'm assuming like you can still use zero. Yeah, you can still use zero. And then how would you also express the, the 32 plus? Huh? Oh, you mean down there? Yeah. Or like the... Oh, okay. All right. So you're referring to this 32. You know, how do we get to that 32? So the question is, how do we get to the 24 to begin with, and how do we get to the 56 to begin with? But that's the distance of the edges, right? So we just have to replace this concrete value with, um, I think this is D of V2 to V3. Oops. Ah, I'm too close to the, uh, to the edge. It doesn't let me do that. There we go. And then this is the distance of V two to v zero okay really bad penmanship here because the uh the digitizer you know somehow you know, there's a little bit of magnetic interference right at that portion of the screen so it doesn't work too well unfortunately so can is that okay i can actually fix that <clears throat> and i have to make sure this is the right erase okay Okay, let me just rewrite that. This is V2, V0. Okay, there we go. So just replace your 56 with, you know, um, v, uh, the distance between V2 and V3, and then replace the 24 with um, the distance of V2 to V0. So that's how we can, you know, then we cannot simplify too much, you know, because we still have two constants on each side, or the distances on each side. Is that okay so far? So that means you know, this number here is going to be a D of V 
to v3 minus d of v2 v0. Um, and if I if I say you know you cannot use zero, how would you fix that problem? <laughs> you can yeah you can yep you can you can just use whatever you know distance minus you know the same thing yep that would work all right so uh, so this is the okay let me point here so this is the upper bound of um, h of v zero v one. And then v, uh, 3v1 also has its own upper bound. So h of v3v1 also has its upper bound. So when we look at the picture of the graph, um, that's, a, that's a really easy one. It's just you know the uh, distance of the edge from v3 to v1 because it's a single edge path. So that means that this just has to be less than or equal to d of v3v1 because it's a single edge path. Is that okay? All right. So the other heuristics, you know, they still have to be greater than or equal to zero and less than the length of the actual shortest path. But the most crucial one is the inequality here. This is the most crucial inequality because this is how we set up the whole problem so that it prefers the wrong path to begin with and then later on to find out, oh, okay, that's not the right path. We have to fix that. So is that okay? Yes. Yeah, admissible, um, and also it cannot be less than zero. Um, but the most crucial part is this part over here, is you know, so that we set it up so that it is not attractive to begin with. The right path seems to be the wrong path to begin with. <clears throat> But all of this is based on the observation when we had concrete numbers to play with on um, Monday. And yep, it's just taking its time. So um, I know there's a little bit discontinuity here because we talked about part one and part two on Monday, and then today we talk about part three. So you, know, you kind of have to just kind of catch up a little bit with what we talked about on Monday. And then this is a generalization of, okay, so what range of values do, can we play with? And then part three is telling you, you know, the range of values that we can play with. As long as these constraints are satisfied, we'll be, we're fine. Is that okay? All right. So what about <clears throat> h of v2 to v1, which is from the origin to the end? It doesn't really matter. Okay. So the only thing that applies here is it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And it has to be less than or equal to the actual length of the shortest path, which all we already know, we have to go from V2 to V0, and then, okay, let me take a look. Yeah, so we have to go from V2 to V0 to V3 and then to V1. So you have to basically look at the sum of those edges and we'll be fine with that particular constraint. So it's 2, 0, 3, 1, okay. So it's two, zero, three, one. So that means it is the distance from V2 to V0 plus the distance from V0 to V3 plus the distance from V3 to V1. So that forms the upper bound of you know, the heuristic of V2 to V1 and then the V the heuristic of v1 to v1 has to be a constant of zero because um, it's already the destination. So that put all the constraints you know, that are ap applicable to every single heuristic value. If you miss, you know, in this particular question, if you miss the constraint on you know, the heuristic value from two, V2 to V1, it's not going to be a big deduction because it really has no influence on the decision made earlier so that we have, we have to um, revisit V3 twice. Uh, same thing applies to this one. If you miss this one, it's not going to be a big deal because it's not also going to have any influence on you know, how we um, you know, make the earlier decision. So the key is really this one. 
and also the upper bound applicable to these two heuristic values. All right, so are we doing okay with the answer to this question? Are we doing okay in terms of how we think about the solution? How do we process the question and how do we figure it out? Go ahead. Um, okay, so the first part here, this part, is just a constraint that we have to put on every single heuristic value that it has to be at least you know, zero. And then this part here is the constraint because we need admissible heuristics, which means you know, the heuristic value, the estimate, cannot be overestimating. It can underestimate, but it cannot overestimate. All right. Are we okay so far? Okay, so <clears throat> the important, the really important part is you really have to understand the algorithm itself. Um, from some conversations, you know, you know, when you were doing on the when you were doing the homework assignment, some people were just kind of copying in general of what I did in class with the example, but that is not a good way to do it. Okay, because you know you can miss certain details, and certainly without understanding the algorithm. You know, this problem would have been very difficult to solve. So the key really is to understand the algorithm and understand exactly what it means for each statement, what we are supposed to do. Okay, so when you have, if you have questions, I still have office hours. I have office hours tomorrow, Friday, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, and Tuesday as well. And because this class is in the afternoon, so that means I still have office hour available for people in this class. So that brings up one question, which is when is our final exam for this class? Um, I'm just using the <clears throat> final exam schedule of the campus. So let's take a look at that one. Because I know some of you have concerns uh, because Iraj, the, the 4.30 class is right before this one. So we are both in the daytime. So for this class, the start time is between 2.45 and 4.45, 4.25. It's a Monday, Wednesday class. So we are having our exam from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. And then I'm suspecting with Iraj's class, it is, when is the start time of the lecture for his class? 1.30? So that would be um, right before this class on the 13th. So that's going to be a little rough for people who are taking both classes in the same semester. Then again, you have 15 minutes to walk across the hallway. <laughs> Even an octopus can do it. You guys have not heard about, you have not heard of octopi walking across land or actual surface, like dry surface. Okay, you have to look up your videos on your know, octopi um, walking on, you know, carpet or just you know bare floor, uh, because they are capable of doing. It. They can quote unquote hold their breath, and then just walk across, you know, and then go to another tank, eat some crabs, and then go back to their own tank. <laughs> yes. Yep, for this class. So, sorry. Yep, same room. Uh, the duration is two hours. So we're gonna get started at exactly 3 p.m. and then I'll collect the exam at 5 p.m. <clears throat> All right. So let's move on to the last question. The last question is really the easiest one. So we'll go ahead and read the question first. You're given the graph, you know, we have five vertices in this case and a whole bunch of edges. Uh, further, you're also given the distance function. This is the uh, distance function here, and then the start ver the S set, okay, which are the destinations, have two vertices, you know, V2 and V0 are the, you know, um, destination vertices. Use the following table to trace Dijkstra's algorithm as discussed in this class and as demonstrated in the homework assignment. Okay, so this one is pretty straightforward, you know, it's really just, you know, following the algorithm, 
on a particular description of the graph and the distance functions. So we, do you guys want me to do it or do you think, ah, okay, we know how to do it already. We'll just, we we'll, might as well go over this, right? Okay. All right, so <clears throat> if you can remember the algorithm, you can actually just do it now, okay, along with me. If you cannot remember the entire algorithm, you can look, you can look it up in the exam. It's open book and open notes. So that means you, know, you can print the entire algorithm and bring it with you. Um, I would suggest that you bring the algorithm, but also with your own annotation so that you can read what is supposed to be done on each line or what each statement is really about. But that's up to you. All right, so the algorithm initializes Q, the set Q with everything in S, and so all the destination vertices are supposed to be in Q to begin with. So I'm not going to write the V anymore, okay? So you know, V2 and V0 is just your know, 2 and 0 here. Um, and then we also have to initialize the L value. <clears throat> so the L value, each L value is the length of the shortest path from the vertex to one of the destinate, to the closest destination vertices. So that means you know, in this case, since V2 and V0 are the destination vertices, the L value corresponding to those two should be zeros. So that's a zero here, that's a zero here, and everybody else has infinity because we are making the worst case you know, um, scenario assumption that there are no paths from V1, V3, and V4 to any of the destinations. So that's how the whole thing is initialized. Um, e prime is also initialized to <clears throat> an empty set here because we have not found any actual solution to the edges. <clears throat> so that's how we get started with this one. I'm just you know, turning off you know, some of the touch gesture because otherwise it just kind of interferes. Actually, yeah, that's, that's what I have to do. All right, so now we can pick you know, one of the two, you know, V1, a V0 or V2, because they both have an L value of zero. If they are not the same, if they do not have the same L value, we have to choose the one with the least L value, okay? So that approach of doing things is what make, makes this algorithm called the greedy algorithm, which in my term is actually more like optimistic, you know, algorithm. So which one do you guys want me to pick? We, we get to pick either V0 or V2. Pick, you know, which one do you want me to use? Zero, okay, fine. So we'll use, you know, um, zero. Okay, we'll, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, which, where to put it. I think where I put it is okay because we have to look at all the incoming edges to vertex zero. So now we have to look at all the edges we really don't need to look at the edges here because every edge has a distance, you know, so we can just look at the distance function and find all the edges anyway. So we are looking at all the incoming edges here, um, and now right away we can see that there's a V2 to V0, okay, so, so 2 to 0 is, is one of the edges. Um, and then the other one is V3, okay, so I'm just pre-filling, you know, all of these. Um, which is not really the order of doing things in the algorithm, but this way, you know, I can basically make sure that I don't miss anything. Um, so I believe these are all the incoming edges to vertex zero. So now I have to find out, okay, do we have to update anything? So now you really have to refer to the algorithm because the algorithm will basically say we're looking at L of V zero, which is a zero, and then we have to add the distance of the edge to zero. <clears throat> so two zero has um, a distance of two. So zero plus two is a two. And then we have to ask, are we finding a shorter path from vertex two to a destination? Vertex two goes like, but I am a destination. I don't need to spend you know, a cost of two to go to another destination. So we did not find a shorter path in this case. And hence, there's no update to the L value of V2, there's no update to E prime, and there's no update whatsoever to Q either. Then we move on to the next iteration of the for each loop, which means you know, we are now looking at the next incoming edge to vertex V0, which is coming from vertex 3. L0 is still, 
L of B0 is still a zero. So now we have to look at the distance of the edge from B3 to B0, which is an eight. So zero plus eight is an eight. So that means I just found um, a path from V0, excuse, excuse me, from B3 to a destination with a length of eight. Is that shorter than, quote unquote, the length of the shortest path that I have at this point? You look at V3, it's like, yep, that seems shorter because you know, we did not actually have a path from before. So that's why we have to do a bunch of updates now. So this has to be, update, has to be updated to eight, which is the, uh, is it eight? Mm -hmm. Yep, it is. <clears throat> And then E prime also has to be updated because now we have three zero as one of the edges in the solution set. And then Q has to be updated. I forgot, keep, I keep forgetting to, to remove the one that I have chosen. But now we have three to keep two company. So those are the updates you know, for the edge you know, three zero. So now we look at the edge one zero and we ask what is the... What is the length of the path from vertex V1 to a destination using the edge 1, 0? So we look at L of 0, which is 0, and then the distance of vertex 1 to vertex 0 is a 2. 0 plus 2 is a 2, and 2 is less than infinity. So now we have another bunch of updates. So we update this to be the 2, and then we have to add... <clears throat> one zero as an edge into e prime we also have to add one or v1 into the set so now it is two three one are we still doing okay so far okay yep go ahead mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it is E, it is asking for an edge. If it's W, then we are just asking from which vertex are we going to W to, to V. So if it's E, it is asking for the edge. All right, so that concludes the for each loop in the first iteration through the while loop. So now we get back to the beginning of the while loop, and it asks, uh, is the set Q empty? No, nope, it's not empty, so we have to go for another iteration through the while loop. So this time we cannot just say, uh, just pick anything from the set Q because we have three different vertices and they have different L values. Um, L of V0 is a zero, excuse me, L of V2 is a zero, L of V3 is an eight, L of V1 is a two. We have to pick the one that is the shortest because you know that's why we call this a greedy algorithm or optimistic algorithm. So that turns out to be vertex two. So we have to pick two out and then the set only has three, one left here. And now we're looking at incoming edges to vertex two. Uh, incoming edges to vertex two includes V zero to V two. Okay. So we have zero two. Um, I think that's it. Oh, no, no, we got, we got one more. We have three of uh, vertex three to vertex two. So I am doing it in this way, you know, just so that, you know, I'm identifying all the incoming edges, which I have to do eventually anyway. So this way, you know, I'm, it's less likely that I'm going to miss one later on. All right. So now we have to go for each edge and evaluate a bunch of stuff. So this one, I think most of you can know that, no, that's not going to be any update because, you know, vertex, um, vertex, zero is already a destination is one of the destinations so it is not gonna we are not going to find a shorter path because uh, edges with a negative distance is not allowed so that means you know the, the lowest it can go is a zero it's already zero we cannot go any lower so that becomes a non-issue nothing to update and then we have to look at um, the edge from vertex three to vertex two vertex three already has a l value so we have to be careful now so according to the distance function, this is a six. So that means, you know, from the perspective of V3, we have found a shorter path with a length of six because vertex two itself is also a destination. And that's why the L value of V2 is a zero. So we're looking at zero plus six in this case, which is just six. 
So that means we have to update um, the L value of V3. So that, that goes from eight to a six. And the tricky part is in E prime, you have to take out everything that starts with V3 and then replace that with the new edge, which is a three, two. So the three, zero is gone. And instead we have a three, two, and the one zero is still going to be here because it's, you know, this has nothing to do with that one. And we have to make sure that three is in the set. It's already in the set, but we are just going to be, you're know, saying that, okay, we quote unquote update the set, even though it does not look like there's any difference. Are we doing okay so far? All right. Um, so that concludes the for each loop at the end of the body of the while loop. We go back to the beginning of the while loop. It says, okay, cube is not empty. We're not done. And now we have vertex three versus vertex one. Which one should I choose? Vertex three now has an L value of six. Vertex one has an L value of two. So we choose the one that has the smallest you know, L value, which is V1 in this case. So vertex one is chosen. And so the set only has three left. Now we have to look at all the incoming edges to vertex one. And there's one here from four to one. And let's see, do we have anything else? No, nope, that's it. Okay. So I just, there we go. All right. So we look at the edge from four, uh, vertex four to vertex one. It has a distance of eight. Okay. So the, we have now just found a path from vertex four to one of the destinations via V1. L of V1 tells us from V1 to get to the closest destination, we need, we, there's a distance of two. There's a, call, a length of two. So we add that two to the eight here, we get a 10. So the question is, is 10, which is the length of the path that we just found from vertex four to a destination, is that shorter than the length of the shortest path that we have found so far? The answer is yep, because we haven't found any path up to this point. So that means we have a little bunch of updates. So this is now updated to a 10, and we have to add the edge into e, uh, e prime. And then we also have to add vertex four to the set, like so. Are there any questions? Nope, okay. So this concludes the for each loop because that's only one edge, you know, ending at vertex one, which is, you know, what we just explored. So now we're getting back to the beginning of the while loop. Q is not empty. We have another iteration, at least one more. And in that one, we have to evaluate, okay, should I pick vertex three or vertex four to explore, you know, so that becomes you know, the, the variable V. Uh, vertex three has a length of six. Vertex four has a length of 10 to the closest destination. So vertex three it is. So we're picking three here. And now we have to look at all the incoming edges to vertex three. So I always scan from the beginning. Nope, 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 nope. Up, oh, there's one over here. So four, three is the edge. All right, so now we have to calculate are we finding a shorter path from vertex four to a destination? Um, V3 is a six, and the distance from V4 to V3 is a two. Six plus two is an eight. So that means I have just found a path from vertex four to a destination, and the length of that path is eight. Compare that to the length of the shortest path I have found so far, which is a 10. Yep, eight is better. So we put an eight here, and then we have to be careful here because you know this time every edge that starts with four needs to be replaced with the new edge. So the new edge is four three. It is going to replace the four one. We have to, um, oh, okay, I forgot to take three out of the set again. Sorry about that. And we are adding four back to the set which is not obvious because you know, four is already in the set queue. So adding four back to the set, you know, does not show that it has changed. 
but you still have to fill that cell so that I know that you know that Q is supposed to be the union of itself and the singleton, the singleton set of just vertex four in this case. All right, back to the beginning of the while loop. Q is not empty. It has one single vertex four in it. So in that case, eh, that's an easy one. We just pick four out and then the set Q now becomes empty. It does not automatically mean that we are done, okay? So we still have to follow through the algorithm to make sure that, you know, it's done. So we are looking for incoming edges to vertex four. Aha, there's one. Now you can say, but it's meaningless, but you cannot terminate the algorithm without showing me that you have explored all the incoming edges to vertex four. So you still have to explore that. It's like zero four is here. Now the nice thing about, you know, this representation of the algorithm or the trace is you don't have to calculate the actual L value of you know, V4 plus the distance of the, or the distance of the edge, you know, V0 to V4. You can just go like, oh, okay, it's not gonna find a shorter path from vertex zero to a destination because guess what? Vertex zero is a destination. We are not gonna find a shorter path. So that means, and since this is the only incoming edge to V4 that concludes the for each loop, then we go back to the beginning of the while loop, which checks whether Q is empty. Q is indeed empty at this point, so we are done. Oof. Okay, so are there any questions? So I would say this is a pretty straight up just a trace of the algorithm. Yep. That is correct. Well, okay, that is not always the case <laughs> because if there are two equal distance paths from one vertex to destinations, then it depends on, you know, because there are certain times we can choose one or the other vertex out of Q because they have the same L value. So now it depends on which one do you choose first. Then, because that is gonna set, you know, which edge you want to use to get to the shortest, to become part of the shortest path. So it does not mean that we end up with exactly, the, we always end up with a, exactly the same E prime. It really depends on the configuration of the graph. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in this case, so it depends on whether we have equal distance paths. So in this case, I'm not sure whether we have equal distance paths. So we can we can make a you know we can just kind of draw out the graph itself and see whether that is the case. So we got uh, five vertices in this case. So we have zero, one, two, three, and four. And we know the destinations are v zero and v two. So this is a destination. This is the other destination. And now we draw the edges, uh, V2 to V0 is, has a distance of two, V0 uh, zero back to V2 also has a distance of two, uh, V4 to V1, V4 to V1 has a distance of eight, uh, V3 to V2, has a distance of six, three to zero, has a distance of eight, uh, zero to four, has a distance of two, and then one to zero, has a distance of two as well, and then four to three has a distance of two. Okay, that looks pretty ugly. <clears throat> um, but the, the question is, from the perspective of each non-destination vertex, do we have equal distance shortest paths to a destination? That is the question. So we just have to look at each one, you know, manually, okay? Um, V1 to V0, that's a two. Um, that's that's pretty much it. I mean, there's, there, there can be no shorter path. All right. 
uh, vertex 4, okay? So vertex 4 can go through the 8 and then the 2 to a 0, which has a length of 10. Uh, 4 can go through vertex 3 to vertex 2, that has a length of 6. Or it can go from vertex 4 to vertex 3 to vertex 0, which is also 10. So even though we have two paths of the same length in this case, but since none of those is the, is the shortest path, it doesn't matter. It would not change the solution E prime. The, what would change the solution E prime is when you have two equal distance shortest paths from a vertex to a destination, then the outcome set E prime may not be the same. It depends on how you, which one you choose first and you know, how you do the updates. Um, but we still have three, okay, so we are not done yet. So vertex three also has two outgoing vertices going straight to um, the destination vertices. So this is an eight, okay, this is a six, but since you know, the six is the shorter path, so the eight is not an issue, it's not even equal distance, so we don't have an issue here either. So that's why in this particular case, um, the solution set of E prime should be the same regardless of how you explore these edges and you know, between zero and two, it doesn't matter which one you, you pick first. So it wouldn't change anything. It would not change the outcome uh, of E prime. Is that making any sense? Okay. So yes, so if I want it to be a little bit tricky, I can set up multiple shortest paths of the same length so that way, you know, how you choose your, to expand the vertices or how you choose to expand, uh, explore the incoming edges will determine which one becomes a part of E prime. All right, so we are done with uh, all four questions from this test. Are there any questions? And we also did, um, I think, two problems on proof by induction. Um, so are there any questions about all of these topics? Go ahead. For practice, I'm not sure whether I have the answers you know, of those ones. Um, let me look at the time. We still got another 25 minutes, so if you want me to get started with some of the even earlier ones, you know, I can do that. Um, okay, let me do that. Um, I think I know how to do it. <clears throat> Give me a second to get those and then you know get it onto the uh, the tablet. Uh, file manager. So this is going to be um, 2022 uh, fall semester. So let's take a look here. I'm looking on the side. You cannot see what I'm doing here. All right, so let's look at the final exams. Uh, we can choose that one. And then we go here, go here, go here. Move that here. Okay. So we got I got it. All right. So we can exit this one. Exit. And this is the uh the one from <clears throat> one semester prior to the one that we just explored. So you can see how this one is from um 2022 fall. Okay, you can see the, the exact date here. Um we always have the same time you know for 440 you know each semester and that's why you know the start time is also 3 p.m um basically last year all right so we are going to turn on continuous scrolling but since i turned off the touch do we turn that on drag there we go all right so with this one Oh, this is a good one. This is fun. <clears throat> so a grower has, so what kind of problem do you want me to go through given that we only got about you know 20 minutes? 
<laughs> okay, so this is a probability one. Uh, question one is a probability. Question two is a, oh, this one, this one, this is A star. Question number three is probability. And then question number four is also probability. So we got three probability ones and then one on A star. Choose wisely. That's a quote from Indiana Jones. <laughs> well, we'll we don't, we probably won't have enough time to do that. So uh, if you want to choose the probability one, which one do you want to use? Choose. This one is me, you know, getting, you know, trying to get socks out of my drawer, and we're trying to calculate the probability or how. Um, what are the chances that I wear mismatched socks three days in a row? When I only have two different, when I have two different types of socks in my drawer, so that's the one question. Um, this is the uh, other probability, which is based on um, when you transmit a bit, there is a chance that it's not going to be transmitted or received correctly, and we want to figure out as a packet, okay, what are the chances that you know up to x many bits are transmitted correctly and so on. And we're going to use an oversampling technique, you know, so that you know each bit is oversampled a few times. So that's question number three. This is the uh, A star algorithm where I give you the trace, and then you have to tell me how the graph is actually constructed originally. So this is the reverse. Okay, I don't give you the actual distances or the heuristic value. I give you the actual trace itself, and you have to work backwards to f to figure out the distances and the heuristic values. And then we have you know, uh, question number one, which is also a probability thing, which is based on um, a farmer trying to uh, grow a crop of something, and you know, it's based on germination rate of the seeds and so on. So pick one, pick one that is fun. What about that bit? Hmm? The bit one, the transmission one, okay. All right, so we'll start with the transmission one. I might have the solution to all of these. You know, I cannot remember. <clears throat> Most likely, I do because you know, I you know, that's how I do the grading. Because otherwise, I have to look at every single variation of all the questions and rework everything from scratch. That would not be efficient. Okay. All right. So part one says when a single bit is transmitted. Okay, there's a typo. Um, you know. There's a chance that it is received correctly, which is 0.96. There's a 96% chance that a bit is received correctly with one single sample. Um, given that a data frame has 128 bits, what is the probability X that not the entire data frame is received correctly? In other words, at least one bit out of 128 is not received correctly. Compute the actual value. In addition to providing the formula, explain the formula. Due to the blah, blah, blah. Okay, so part one is just here. Okay, so part one ends right here. Okay, so let's go ahead and work on it. <clears throat> so part one, how would you solve this problem? We have 128 bits in a data frame. The chances of each bit being received correctly is 96%. I'm trying to figure out um, what is the, yeah, go ahead. That would, that would give you the probability of every single bit received wrong, incorrectly. Because you're basically saying wrong bit, wrong bit, wrong bit, wrong bit, wrong bit. Oh, one minus the entire thing. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. I misunderstood what you're subtracting from the one and what you're doing with it. <clears throat> okay, so yes, that is the actual answer. Okay, so because you know, when you have 0.96 raised to the power of 128, that is the probability of receiving receiving every single bit correctly, and we're looking for the complement of that. Okay, so part one is one minus. 0.96 raised to the power of 128. 
So you look at this number and you would think that this is a relatively small number because 0.96 is pretty close to one. So when you multi when you raise that number to you know some power, it is also still pretty close to one. And one minus something that is close to one is a small number. That is actually not the case. <laughs> <laughs> because 96.96 raised to the power 128 is actually a fairly small value already because of the of the exponent. So uh, let's do that with a calculator. Um, so I'm just going to use my <coughs> phone app calculator here. You guys can do the calculations because I know you guys have you guys got fancy calculators. So 0.96 raised to the power, oops, okay, 0.96, raised to the power of 120, 128 is, okay, I cannot remember, there we go, it's actually um, less than 1%. <laughs> yeah, this number is really small. It is 0 0.005379 something. There we go. All right. So that's awful, which because it basically means you know, the chances of it and the entire data frame transmitted correctly is almost zero. It's really close. I would not be, I would not be playing League of Legends over this network. <laughs> yes. Oh right, yeah. So it's yep. So okay, sorry, I forgot about that. All right, so let's do the um, sign negation, one plus. So it's 19, okay, so it's 0.99462 in this case. So 99.462% of the chance is, is the chance of the, the packet does not get transmitted correctly. All right, so given that the data frame is has 120 bit, what is the probability that X cannot, that the probability X, this is X, okay, there we go, that not the entire data frame is received correctly. So that's good. So most of the time, okay? So due to the relatively high probability that a data frame contains at least one error, an oversampling method is used. In this method, each bit is repeated, um, repeatedly sampled seven times. In other words, during the time of transmitting one bit, I go like sample, hardware, sample, 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 sample. So I sample seven times for the same single bit when it's being transmitted. Whatever value, one or zero, that is the majority of the samples, becomes the assumed value. In other words, if I receive you know, three ones and four zeros, then I'm gonna say, okay, it's probably a zero. Um, if I receive, you know, um, all seven ones, obviously, it's going to be interpreted interpreted as a one. So that so that's the reason why I choose a uh, odd number because you know, we can always determine uh, do we have more zeros and ones or the other way around. Does that is that understood? Okay. So right away, I hope some of you are already thinking. Hmm, smells like coin flip, <laughs> right? Because, you know, every, so, okay, so let's read the, the rest of the question. So it further explains, you know, if the sample va sampled values are 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, as a tuple, because, you know, that's a sequence, with a sample size of 5, then we basically assume the, uh, the bit being transmitted is a 1, because 1 is the majority of the samples, you know, the oversampling of the same bit. Is that okay? Does everybody understand what is oversampling? During the time of transmitting one single bit, I basically sample it x many times, seven times, five times, nine times, and so on, okay? All right, so part two is asking what are the chances are that the majority of the samples correctly reflect the actual value, okay? So that means you know, if a one is being transmitted, what are the chances that uh, out of the seven samples, the four, five, six, or seven of them would also be ones. That's what it's asking. Um, um, again, compute the actual value in addition to providing the formula and the explanation of the formula. So the first thing you need to do is to think about what type of experiment is this? So I gave you a little spoiler earlier already, but let's go back and re-examine you know, why I came to that conclusion. 
So if you're only looking at the oversampling of the transmission of one bit as an experiment, in, according to this question, how many trials do we have in one experiment? Seven. Very good. Okay, so I, I, I'm glad that nobody is mentioning 128. <laughs> okay, so seven is correct. All right, so let's write it down, okay? So each experiment, each, has seven samples or seven trials. Okay, and when you look at each trial, what, how many outcomes do we have for each trial? Or at least the first trial? Two, okay. What about the second trial? Two, third trial, two, and so on. Because each trial is basically just saying, okay, I'm, I'm looking at the hardware stuff and I'm trying to interpret, is that a one or a zero, okay? So we have two possible outcomes, one or zero. Okay, so, we, so is that with or without replacement? It is with replacement, right? Okay, so we have already, we, we got a few things pointing to the direction of coin flips already because um, the trials are with replacement and every trial has two outcomes. And do we know the probability of each outcome per trial? I don't care about the entire experiment. I'm only, foc I'm only focusing on each trial. Yeah, we do. Okay, if the actual bit is a one, the chances of receiving as a one is 96%. Okay, and the chances of receiving incorrectly is 0.04. So we know the probabilities already. So that tells me that this is a binomial distribution. Okay, so we say binomial distribution. So you kind of have to write down a little bit more than this you know, when you're explaining it. <clears throat> okay. So given that, how do we compute the actual value um, of um, the majority of samples correctly reflect the actual value? So in this case, you have to say P is the probability of receiving a bit correctly, which turns out to be 0 0.96 in this case. Okay. So how are we going to use this? How are we going to use this and also the binomial distribution to figure out the answer to this question? Well, we want to look at all the cases where the correct bit is the majority. What do, we mean, what do we mean by majority? Well, since we have seven samples, so that means in this case, four samples, five, six, and seven of receiving correctly is, and we have to sum up all of those probabilities, okay? So that means, you know, we are going to use the probability thing. It's going to be a sigma, unless you want to really write out everything by hand. But each one is going to be saying, going like, okay, out of a sample of seven, okay, out of a, out of seven trials, we need I of them to be receiving bits correctly. Is that making any sense? Okay. And then, <clears throat> if P is the probability of receiving a bit correctly, then we are raising P to the power of I, and then 1 minus P would be raised to the power of 7 minus I. Does that make sense? Because you know, we would have I of the bits received correctly, and then we would have 7 minus I of those bits received incorrectly with the probability of 1 minus P. Um, all right, so now, you know, I have to figure out where do I go, what is the range of I, what is the range of that index? Four to seven, very good. Yep, so it's just a matter of, you know, going through this calculation using a calculator. Okay, but once you set up the equation or once you set up the formula and explain to me why you are using this formula, you're going to get most of the points. Is that okay? That's the answer of part two. Okay, so this is P2, part two. So now we work on part three. Um, and there's a particular number or the value associated with it, which is R. So now you go to part three. With every bit in a data frame oversampled, what is the probability Y, probability y 
that not the entire frame is received correctly. So the setup is similar to P1, except instead of using 0.96, you're going to use R as the probability of receiving a bit correctly. So, you know, um, it becomes, you know, uh, 1 minus uh, R in this case raised to the power of 128, whatever the R turn, turns out to be. Okay, so what do you think R is going to look like? Okay, let's, let's, let's work this out, okay, because I want you to actually see the value. So let's work this out. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is going to use, ooh, where is it? I'm trying to find the, uh, the tab for this class. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> and open a new tab, put it on this screen. There we go. Uh, we will go to my Google Drive, go to CISP, for, CISP 400, and I'll put it into the share folder, so this way you, know, you guys can actually see it, even now, um, well, once I create a file. So I'm gonna name this after today's date, makes it easier to find. 2023, uh, today is the 6th, there we go, okay. So this column is going to be I, uh, we know it goes from 4 to 7, right, so 4, and then this is whatever before plus 1, <clears throat> and just kind of drag this down to, until we got 7, there we go. Um, and then we have the combination, okay, so this is, uh, you know, uh, Seven choose I, so that becomes your know, combin seven and then whatever number is in column A. Now I don't really have to spell it out like this, you know, but I want to you know kind of make it more obvious so that you guys can actually see the values. Um, this becomes you know P raised to the power of um, I in this case, so we are looking at point um, power. 0.96 and um, whatever is I here, okay. All right, and then we will look at the other one, which is uh, one minus P raised to the power of seven minus I. <clears throat> so once again, we have a power, it's one minus P, which is uh, 0.96 raised to the power of 7 minus i, and i is column A, like so. And we just drag this down. All right, so now we have a summation of the entire thing, right? So we have the product. Okay, I'm sorry, not summation, product first. So we have the product of everything along this row, except for i. i is just an index variable. So now we just ask for this number times this number times this number. And then we just drag this to get all four cells. And now we can add them up, right? Because we have a sigma. So now we are looking at the sum of these particular values, like that. And it is, it's a very favorable number. <laughs> it's 99.99% that the entire frame is going to be received correctly. Is that okay? All right. So, um, so for part four, we are looking at, um, okay, so in something is wrong, okay? Something is wrong is this probability when every single bit is oversampled, you know, seven times. So it becomes, this number becomes one minus uh, this number uh, to the power of 128 because we have 128 bits in a frame. So now the error rate, this is the error rate, becomes 1%. Instead of um, earlier, it is 99.4%. So it's much better. This is oversampling. All right. So 
So someone may ask, so does oversampling work in real life? Do people actually do oversampling? <clears throat> you can ask your parent, okay, you know, or your grandparent in some cases about CD, compact discs. So there was one time in our history where music is distributed in physical form as compact discs. Now, compact discs by itself is not a bad technology. We basically use laser to burn tiny little holes on something that is reflective. Typically, it's either a very thin uh, foil of gold or aluminum. Aluminum is dirt cheap, but gold means, you know, okay, it can last a long time. The problem is not so much with the metallic material. The problem is with the plastic, you know, that you're encasing the, the metallic material in because plastic scratches. <laughs> okay. So a CD you know, reader, okay, is going to have a lot of problems because you know, depending on how scratchy the surface is, you know, the uh, bit, you know, whether there's a hole on the reflective medium or not, may not be interpreted correctly. So back in those days, there's oversampling, exactly the way I describe it. So for the same position, okay, you know, or during the time when the hole is supposed to fly, or when one single bit is supposed to fly over the disc head, which is really just a pickup on the reflection, um, the mechanism will oversample. It will sample it like many, many times in order to use this method to try to get the right bit interpreted. So oversampling is not something that I just invented for the class you know, exam. It is actually a technology that is used in you know, reading a CD, reading a compact disc. And you can also see you know, the dramatic increase of the probability of reading something successfully. This is unsuccessful. Before, it was 99% you know, incorrectly. You know, most of the time, it's going to be uh, received incorrectly as a frame. Now it is 1% of the chance. So TCP IP is a little bit different. You know, we only got like two minutes left. Yet. I don't have enough time for another question. So TCP IP, I think is particularly um, IP because TCP is the part where um, it makes sure that everything is received in the correct order. But IP is the part that makes sure that things are transmitted correctly. Um, so in that case, you know, it really does not take, so by the time you get to uh, TCP IP, you're not at the hardware level anymore. So the data frame is already taken care of. So the only thing it does is you know, each packet has a checksum. And then it just you know, check the checksum of each packet. If it is not received correctly, in the case of TCP, then it's going to ask the originator to retransmit that particular packet. In case of um, UDP, which is another protocol that can sit on top of IP, because IP is just routing. IP is really just the standard of how to route a packet from an IP address to another IP address. So UDP, which is um, user datagram uh, protocol, is does not have any checksum whatsoever. So it's it's just like you know sending a postcard to someone. You you write the address, you put the content on it, and they put it into the the mailbox. Whether the other side receives it or not, there's no UDP does not determine you know how to make sure that is happening. So, so, so UTP does not even care whether you know, the other side gets the packet or not. But this type of oversampling does not apply at that level of networking. This is applied usually at the data frame, which is one of the lowest levels of the OSI model. And then they use this method to make sure the frame is received correctly. Because at that le level, you can be using um, fiber optics, you can be using DSL, you can be using um, your know, Wi-Fi, you can be using um, good old you know, copper wire, you can be writing something on top of a, real, a serial line. So a lot of things can happen at that level, and it's at that level that it, they would do um, uh, oversampling, and um, they can also self-correct when a data frame is not received correctly. At that level, you know, the, the hardware mechanism can request a retransmit and it's all done without any visibility of the higher level of the OSI model. Yep, fun stuff in networking. 
Yep, and that probability changes. Okay, if you if there's a microwave oven between your gaming computer <clears throat> and your Wi-Fi router, you know you have to make sure nobody is going to microwave anything when you're playing your video game, <clears throat> especially if when your network is only uh, capable of 2.4 gigahertz. Because guess what, 2.4 gigahertz is also the uh, frequency, the microwave fre frequency that will uh, excite water molecules. So water molecules is a V because it's H2O, right? So it looks like a V. So it can vibrate in many ways like this and then also this way. But it's this vibration that has a natural resonance frequency that is in the range of 2 point something gigahertz. So when microwave energy hits water molecule, you know, it would resonate. So the water molecule will kind of wave like this you know, more and more, and that's how it heats up water. But that also is about the same frequency as your Wi-Fi router. <laughs> and the microwave is a far stronger transmitter compared to your Wi-Fi router by a long shot. Because you can try to heat up a, you know, like water, put your water right next to your Wi-Fi router, crank the transmitter you know, power up, and see how long it takes to warm up that water. I can tell you it's not going to have any discernible difference. <laughs> but the microwave will heat up like this much water, 15 seconds maybe. So even though a microwave has a cage to make sure that you know, it doesn't leak out a lot of microwave you know, energy, enough is going to get out to interfere with Wi-Fi transmission. So my advice is upgrade to five gigahertz because that is no longer the same range as your microwave open. So I'll be good. I'll be learning anything useful in this class, like how to set up your gaming computer networking. <laughs> All right, so I'll see you guys next Wednesday at 3 p.m. But I also have office hours every day. So if you need to talk to me about any topic in this class, you know, just come to my office hour. Yes, from 8 to 9 on most days. Yep. There's no class on Monday. Yep, this is our last lecture. This is, we're done with lecture here. Okay, give me a second to stop the recorder.